Um, awesome. Okay, so let's start. So this is Alex from Near. Uh, this is going to be a panel on uh, on uh, protocols that uh, try to have some sort of communication between multiple chains. We have uh, three panelists here. Well, I guess four panelists, including me. Uh, we have Zaki from Cosmos and Tendermint Labs. We have Justin from Ethereum and Alistair from uh, from Polkadot uh, and Web3 Foundation. And can you guys uh, give a quick introduction about yourselves and uh, maybe say a few words about the protocol and especially about the uh, the intended use case or intended goal of the protocol? And we can start with Zaki. OK. Uh... Zaki Munyan. Uh, I work at Tendermint. I've been involved in the Cosmos projects basically since it was first conceived. Um, and like more broadly, I've been in the in the blockchain sharding community um, for a very long time. Um, I've, I've been thinking about sharding ideas for a very long time. Um, Cosmos, like for, for just quickly, uh, is like very much came out of like my desire to build a, a, a uh, to approach sharding from a different direction from what it seemed like everyone else was, which is start with very minimal assumptions about how different uh, components in the system um, are able to trust each other and offer um, uniform security and then and build an integrated system from that and then um, and then you know explore all of these different sharding ideas uh, over time. Um, so so that's what cosmos is. Uh, cosmos is, Basically, a, a, a unified or a, uni, a connected world of, of blockchain applications, where each chain is its own sovereign, uh, independently secure entity. Cool, Justin. Sure. Yeah. So I am uh, Justin from the Ethereum uh, <coughs> research team, um, and specifically working on Ethereum 2.0. I guess um, you know sharding and the data availability problem were uh, was what got me uh, started in the research space. So it's um, quite dear to my heart. I mean, now I work on, on all aspects of Ethereum 2.0, uh, but still very much interested in uh, sharding uh, technologies and uh, designs and trade-offs. Um, I guess in terms of what the goal for Ethereum 2.0 is, um, you know, try and be uh, a... <laughs> Scalable platform for for small contracts, I guess, and by scalable, you know, we want to try and 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 push the limits as to what is possible at the at layer one in terms of providing um, kind of a, a very secure and and, and homogeneous uh, base layer, um, and in terms of scalability, we're looking to have you know a thousand shards, which you can think of roughly as a a thousand copies of Ethereum 1.0, which roughly have the the same kind of security guarantees as Ethereum 1.0 today. And then, if you need more scalability on top of that, then um, that's where the the application layer comes in, the layer two uh, scalability solutions. And you know, Ethereum is known to unlock these these kind of things, and was a pioneer there. You know, with uh, with the EVM being a very generic and flexible platform. Awesome. And Alistair? Uh, OK, I'm Alistair Stewart. I'm a, um, a theoretical computer scientist by trade. I'm at the uh, the Web3 Foundation now, and I'm working on Polkadot. So Polkadot um, has the idea that we wanted um, lots of different chains, lots of different state machines um, on top of sort of common abstraction um, with the idea that it should all be one system. Somehow everything could talk to each other. Everything should have a, a, a single security model. Cool. Okay. And so, I guess the first interesting question is, and it's uh, there are two questions in one. So one question is, when uh, for each of the protocols, right, for Cosmos, Ethereum, and Polkadot, the user when they interact with the with the protocol, do they interact with the protocol as a whole, or do they interact with particular zones, parachains, or shards? Uh, and from there, the second question on top of that immediately is. Uh, how what how is the security of which hard zone or parachain is ensured and uh, how uh, uh, and so in, in in all protocols are validators right how are they selected for each of the zones uh, and I guess we can go in the same order right Zaki are you muted I'm unmuting myself uh, I have a little bit of a cough so I've been muting myself um, the uh, so the 
Okay, so Cosmos, very simple answers to those questions. Um, every zone, users generally interact with uh, zones one at a time. Um, you know, they may uh, uh, engage in cross zone behavior. Um, it may be eventually possible. It may eventually be the case that uh, that you know people we build higher level abstractions over multiple zones. But currently, what is mostly contemplating is um, uh, interacting with one zone at a time. Um, so then the second question was uh, about security and validator sets. Um, uh, in general, zones choose their own validator sets. Um, and while we think that there will be sort of economies of scale here where um, uh, I think the term Julian used is like famous validators um, and there will be, well, you know, uh, a highly overlapped group of validators on, on, on a large number of chains, um, there's nothing in the protocol that requires it or assumes that that is true. Cool, Justin. Well, yeah, so I guess just stepping back, to, the way I think about it is that, in terms of interacting with the the the, the wider system in an abstract way, or versus interacting with a, a specific part of the system, the the latter is strictly more powerful. So um, you can do one with the other, but not the other way around. So you know, we want to expose to DApp developers the, the most powerful primitive, which is to interact with a, a specific shard. But then, of course, nothing prevents you to, for the end user, from, from a user experience standpoint, if you do wish to abstract it away and you do wish to interact with multiple shards, um, then you, you can totally do that. Um, one of the things maybe worth mentioning that, um, at the execution layer, you know, each shard with her will have its own separate um, uh, EVM, but nothing prevents you from kind of merging the the data availability layers of the, of the shard. So you can have an alternative execution engine which basically combines, let's say, four different shards, and then you have your um, that's one way of of abstracting. But you can also, of course, abstract. Um, kind of using the, the EVM as one of your, your building blocks and you abstract away, for example, the notion of a cross-shot transaction away from the user. In terms of our security model, you know, every shard is, is homogeneous and we kind of want to have this massive pool of security that is bootstrapped from the existing Ethereum ecosystem. So, you know, we have over $10 billion of, 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 of tokens and we want to make use of that. So we're hoping to have you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe even close to a million validators uh, staking into this one huge pool. And then we want to have a, a smart mechanism of um, yielding every single individual shard basically the same, roughly the same security as the big pool. And we, we do that using um, statistically representative sampling of, of committees. Um, so. In terms of uh, the details of our security model, it's mostly just an honesty assumption on the big pool of validators. Yeah, but and that's a very subjective question. But when you think of Ethereum, do you think of it as a uh, like a single protocol that consists of multiple shards, or, or do you think of it more as like multiple independent blockchains which happen to be homogeneous and and share security? Um. So okay, the, 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 the difference is a bit subtle. Can you re repeat the difference? Right, so it, it's more uh, it, it's more like the way I think about Ethereum versus let's say Cosmos, right? Is that Cosmos is, in Cosmos, the, uh, the the zones are very differentiated, right? And clearly in, interact with the zone. So I'm curious if, so when I think of Ethereum, for me, Ethereum 2.0, it's more of a single protocol, which just happens to be sharded. But from your answer, it seems like the way you look at it is, is, is more uh, like multiple independent shards, right? Where people, clearly understand. Uh, so, so I guess like the question is, as a developer, when I deploy a smart contract, uh, presumably I the, good, the good way to think about it, right? One, one way I'm, I'm thinking when I'm deploying a smart contract is I'm deploying it to Ethereum 2.0. And another way of thinking it is I'm deploying it to specific shard of Ethereum 2.0, right? So, so what model do you think developers will mostly have? Oh, I see, okay. So from the point of view of, uh, of a designer, basically what, what I do at different foundation, there's a single protocol and it's very clean and unified and, and, and simple. 
and that you know we don't try and have uh, special cases which would complex things. But from the point of view of a DApp developer, you know you there will be um, you know you will have some sort of a preference as to choosing one shot or another. Um, one consideration is um, that within a single shot you will have synchronous um, kind of across contract calls, whereas across shards, um, at least in the default EVM, you will have asynchronous uh, calls. And so if you want to do uh, syn uh, synchronous calls with a very specific contract, um, let's say you're building on top of CryptoKitties and you, know, you want to be in the same shard as CryptoKitties. The other consideration uh, beyond uh, proximity to other contracts will be uh, the gas market. So every single shard will have a different um, gas market. And you know some might be higher priced than others because they're more popular. And so if you have the luxury of um, choosing your shard because you have a, a, a DAP which is uh, more decoupled from uh, than others, then you, you're going to want to favor the, 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 the cheaper shards. I guess one thing which kind of goes against this idea that um, every shard is special and you want to choose the best one is that you can totally have the notion of, of yanking. So at the uh, application layer, at least, you, you can have the option of having logic, which allows you to hop from one shard to another. And so you're not necessarily tied to one shard. And so in, from that point of view, you go back more to the designer's point of view, where everything is homogeneous and fungible. So. I just wanted to jump in and comment, and I want to say that like the goal of, of of having this uniform interface across many chains is 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 I think like one of the most appealing things in blockchains. Um, it's like you know I've been you know I think I've been talking about it for five years at this point. Um, it's it's sort of been I think I'm it's like one of the most exciting visions. It's also probably the most technically hard to achieve. Um, and I definitely don't feel qualified to know how to design a system that fully uh, 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 manifests that vision. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, Alistair, uh, the same question. Uh, are you <coughs> the parachains or the relay chain and uh, uh, like few words about the security? Right, yeah. So the, the, so the principle is that the user mostly is interacting with the parachains. And as much as the security as possible is, um, do, is a function of the entire validator set of the relay chain. So we, we envisioned there being a thousand uh, validators. Starting at maybe a maybe hundred, maybe we're gonna we scale it to more than a thousand. Um, and where possible, they um, get to de decide the security. We're gonna divide them into sort of small committees to do with each parachain, but ultimately they're going to be ways of sort of bypassing that if one of these committees turns out to be bad because they're so small. Um, each individual parachain it has its own set of collators. Sort of by default, you only need to be, have a, a security model there for censorship resistance um, and not for the security of the things we care about. But parachains can be different and some of them can, uh, some of them will need their own security. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the collators, uh, parachains choose collators themselves, right? Yes. So, so that would be close to the concept of validators in Cosmos, right? Which are also chosen by, by the zone. Well, yes, except that they're not, uh, they're responsible for much less. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Notionally, collators are only responsible for transaction ordering. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, we definitely need uh, collators for censorship resistance, but if, unless the, the power chain has its own consensus, uh, the security should be sort of guaranteed by the, the validators of the relay chain. Uh, I can't hear Alex. Um, yeah. You said Alex, Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. Uh, so the question was, uh, the number of uh, 
validators in each power chain at each given moment is on the order of five, right? So, so what happens when they all corrupted? Oh, so ten, right? What happens if they're all corrupted? Well, then we have to rely on some actor pointing it out. Um, so the the separate things for for validity and data availability, which we might be getting onto. Mm -hmm. um, but the basic idea for validity is that some fisherman could come along and point out this thing is wrong and back that up with stake. And if that happens, then other random people go and check it. Mm -hmm. And when there's a disagreement, we can, everyone checks it and we can slash them. Or we can slash them all if they're a problem. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, yeah. And, and I think that's a good, good moment to start talking about uh, what can go wrong and, and how to defend against it. And we can start with the, uh, with Polkadot since we, we just started talking about fishermen, right? So there are a few things that can go wrong, right? Uh, if the uh, if the validators that are assigned to a particular parachain are corrupted, they can, in principle, attempt to fork to create invalid state transition and uh, to withhold the blocks, right? So well, they can't, yeah, the, the forking isn't sort of defined, but the invalid state transition is is the problem. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I, there's worse, there's other things they can do. So there's the data availability, there's um, a collator and some validators can collude to not tell the other other relay, uh, the other uh, actors in the same chain what happens. So we have this issue that we don't have. Uh, so if you're an individual chain and it has its own security, then you know you produce a block, and it's in your interest to make sure that everyone else knows this block for something like Bitcoin, right? Um, but if some uh, other chain is responsible for deciding the consensus, what happens, then there's no reason why it should give you the data at all. Um, so we have to make I sure. To, uh, just for the purposes of the, the panel and for the wider audience, I want to kind of like zoom out and explain the data availability problem a little bit. Because probably for the four of us, we, we all have know exactly what we mean, but I would say the larger audience probably has no, has, there's definitely people in the audience who don't know. So um, can I take a shot at it? If that's sure, okay. Sure. okay. I'm, I'm, this is mostly just a, a quick summary of Joseph Poon's talk on data availability. So one of the things that is, is, is most intriguing about Bitcoin and proof of and proof of work consensus is that it gave us not necessarily strong guarantees, but reasonably good guarantees about data availability. And what data availability means is that the blocks that are being generated are actually available, that you can download them from the Internet. Um, and what would be the problem if the data was not available? is for instance, you could, uh, no one would be able, only the people who had the data was available would be able to spend money. Um, and one of the manifestations of, of, of attacks on data availability in proof of work cryptocurrencies is the selfish mining problem, where you mine blocks, but you don't make them available. Um, and, the, and this is mostly an attack on the incentive systems, um, but as we build these more complicated systems, the attacks get worse. Um, if you can, if you can produce blocks and make them unavailable. So, uh, and basically the assumption of, 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 of proof of work uh, in proof of work is that if you're not broadcasting your blocks, um, and you control less than 51% of the, uh, 50 plus 1% of the, of the hash power, um, mining, um, the people, the miners who are honestly broadcasting their blocks will eventually produce a longer chain and the data unavailable chain uh, will not be canonical. Um, so this is like a really exciting and clever property of, um, of, uh, of, 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 of proof of work. Um, and, you know, there's like a massive literature around um, consensus in distributed systems that goes back 40 years. But like the literature around the, or the study of this problem of how do you actually ensure in a distributed system that the uh, data is available um, is is relatively uh, interesting and new and is like a research frontier. So um, you know, uh, uh, Cosmos we we explicitly punt on the data availability problem and uh, uh, attempt to design a system that doesn't solve it. And one of the things that's most interesting about the systems that both uh, Alistair and, and Justin are building is that they explicitly need to solve this problem uh, in order for their systems to be secure. Cool. So, so Alistair, 
would you like to yeah. give us some overview of how Polkadot is solving it? Right. So, sort of. Um, so, one of the simplest ways of, of solving this data availability problem. So, you, you have this problem that there's too much data for everyone to hold. Um, yet, we'd like sort of an honest majority to be able to uh, be sure that they have all this data. And uh, one solution to that is uh, this array coding idea. What we do is we have this data and we give a little piece of every piece of data to everyone. Uh, such that we can then go, uh, if we have enough people, we can reconstruct it. And so, so we sort of apply that with the, the relay chain validators. So each of those gets a piece of each of the power chain blocks. And then we know that if, if we ever finalize something, it must be because uh, you know, at least, um, well, two thirds of people are gonna vote for it. And in some Byzantine agreement, and this means if, you know, if two thirds of those were honest, then one third of people should um, have had all these pieces, and we, we we set things up so that they can reassemble everything. Of course, then the question is: is when do they? When does someone reassemble? Um, and that's that's the harder part. I mean, basically, if people say something's missing, we have to have random people attempting to reassemble it and pass it around. Mm -hmm. Um, and once you've solved availability, then yeah, then getting someone to point out something's incorrect is the easier problem. And, and so, uh, in Polkadot, the primary assumption is that every parachain someone cares about, right? And so there's at least one person who is validating all the blocks. And there, and so yeah, so so that there should be someone checking it. Well, someone is fisherman checking every parachain. Yeah. And we'd also like um, the the ideal would be, you know. All these power chains are public, and we could also trust uh, a majority of people who produce the majority of the collectors as well. But we want something that holds, um, you know, with different levels of certainty depending on uh, how many of these sets are honest. Mm -hmm. And and why? Why? So you started by saying that forks are completely impossible. So what is preventing forks from happening? Oh, on Polkadot, I didn't say anything about forks. Mm. Uh, but like, so let's say that the. So, so we, we uh, yeah, yeah. so, so, so the, the, the relay chain forks, but a, a sort of state of the relay chain determines the power chain. I see. The, right. the, so the, the um, a relay chain block determines what all the power chains are. So only the relay chain can fork. Right. Okay. So effectively, the the power chains, uh, the fork chain rule would always favor the the last block, which was uh, snapshot to the power chain to, to the relay chain, right? Yeah. Well, the the the, the relay chain sort of determines the power chain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, by having explicitly the hashes of parachain blocks go on the relay chain. And that's what determines what's happened. Right. And so, but the, the parachain could be a little bit ahead of the relay chain, right? As a user of the parachain, shall I, shall I not respect those blocks until I see them on the relay chain or? Uh... Well, you can, but even if you see them on the relay chain, that doesn't mean they're, they're final yet. Mm -hmm. But when something's finalized on the relay chain, it's finalized. Thanks, sir. Cool. Okay. Uh, so, so Justin, the same uh, set of things is uh, how how is Ethereum 2.0 preventing forks, uh, and and what is the story with state validity and data availability on the shards? Yeah. So, um, in terms of uh, data availability and um, you know the e execution, we we have a an honest majority assumption, and we have these committees, and I guess. Unlike Polkadot, we, we we make sure that there's at you know just just one person who is is honest whenever we reach a, a quorum. So whenever we reach the threshold of signatures uh, required for um, some sort of a, a vote from a committee to be to be meaningful, then we make sure that uh, there's at least one honest person. And so this one honest person, in the case of data availability, is sufficient to gossip to the rest of the network. Um, the, the data that they have made sure is available because they they have downloaded it and they still have a copy on their computer. So um, we don't use uh, fancy erasure codes, um, at, at least uh, for, for phase one. Uh, one of the cool things that we have is that for data availability uh, specifically, we have um, a, a slightly weaker security model, um, which 
is basically trying to incorporate the, the notion of, of laziness of, um, of validators. So one of the problems with um, data availability and kind of uh, rewarding it with micro incentives, you know, by saying, hey, I have downloaded the data and uh, here's me vouching for it, is that validators can just uh, do copycat voting. So they can look at what other validators have done and if you know, a, a reasonably large portion of validators have uh, vouched that a piece of data is available, then, you know, as a rational validator who's kind of lazy, I don't need to download the data. I can just vote what other, people's, uh, what other people are doing. And that's, that's kind of bad. So one, uh, the mechanism that we have to prevent that is the idea of, uh, of uh, proofs of custody. So Basically, we want to make sure that when you uh, vouch that a certain piece of data is available, we want to make sure that at the very least, you've downloaded it and it's on your computer. Um, and so we have this scheme which involves custody bits. And the idea here is that um, we, to make the, the data kind of specific to you, to have some sort of fingerprint which is unique to you and the data, we will sample a, we'll ask the, the validator to, to sample a private key, which is unique to them, and then mix the private key with the data, and then kind of extract the so-called custody bit, which is going to be the, the fingerprint unique to the, to the validator. And we're going to assign value to this private key in such a way that if um, the validator is, is being lazy and wants to outsource the work of um, extracting this this custody bit to someone else, then they have to give them the private key and, and, and they stand to lose the funds. And if they want to be lazy in the more uh, uh, direct approach where they, you know, they don't bother with the custody bit and they kind of choose it at random and have the time they, they stand to be, to be slashed. Um, so one, one interesting thing is that this, this, this same idea can actually apply to execution as well. So what you can do is that you can, uh, basically what you want to do is you want to force every validator to, to go through the, the execution when they receive a block, as opposed to looking at what other validators say is the end result of an execution and just voting for that. And so what you can do there is you can take the execution trace of a, a block from uh, one state root to another. And in the execution trace, you mix in the, this, this private key that I was talking about. And then you'll have basically an execution trace, which is unique to you. And um, you're basically proving to the network that you have made the execution. And so we can uh, potentially reduce the, um, the the, the security assumptions for both data availability and an execution. Um, the other question is, how do we prevent forks? So I guess there's, there's two places where forks can happen. One is on the beacon chain, which is the system chain common to all the shards. And then the other place where there can be forks is in the shards. So in the beacon chain, we kind of have a, a so-called hybrid fork choice rule. So we have, um, a mechanism which is uh, called LMD ghost, which is kind of the the short term mechanism, and you can you can think of it as a as basically an upgrade to the the longest chain rule uh, to Bitcoin. It's just a a slightly better mechanism which incorporates more information uh, than just the longest chain. And in addition to that, we have a finality gadget, which is, which is a Casper FFG, which you know every every epoch in the best case, so every few minutes will basically uh, economically finalize uh, the, the chain, meaning that if there's two um, finalized uh, points in the, in the beacon chain which are co conflicting with, with each other, then at least one third of the total validator pool will get slashed. And hopefully there'll be billions and billions of dollars in the validator pool so that one third is a very, very meaningful uh, portion uh, to, to be smashed. And then in, in the shards, what happens is that 
the shards are kind of dependent on the beacon chain. So if if the beacon chain uh, forks, then kind of the the, the, the shards uh, may have to fork uh, with it. But as, if if the, the the beacon chain does doesn't fork and just continues, then um, the the shards can have kind of shorter local local forks, and and these are resolved in the same way as the beacon chain. So uh, with the idea of LMD ghost, which is just this upgrade uh, to the longest chain rule. And the, 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 the weighting that we use uh, is basically economic weight by stake as opposed to using uh, you know, thermal dynamic uh, weight as in, as in proof of work. Mm. Uh, and, the, uh, and the state validity. So what happens if uh, one of the shards gets corrupted and they produce an invalid block and it gets on the beacon chain, snapshot on the beacon chain? Yeah, so hopefully that 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 should not happen if if our assumptions are correct, uh, our security assumptions. If if it does happen for some reason or another, uh, some sort of e exceptional condition, then in in at least phase two we would have to do a, a manual rollback, um, and that that would be really bad because we'd have to manually roll back the beacon chain and hence manually roll back the whole Ethereum two point system. And even worse than that, we would have to roll back the finality gadget, because the finality gadget is, is not aware of data availability. So um, in a way, producing uh, uh, an in invalid so-called crosslink um, from, from uh, invalid uh, you know, unavailable data or an invalid state transition from a shard is, is, is very, very bad. Um, in looking kind of more towards the future for Ethereum 3.0 or maybe phase three plus, um, we have this uh, <clears throat> mechanism uh, which we call uh, data availability proofs, which uses the erasure codes. And it, it's kind of interesting because it's a, it's a different way to think of data availability. Like you can think of it kind of uh, objectively from the point of view of the validators, or you can think of it subjectively from the point of view of of the of the nodes of the, of the users of the network themselves and so we, we have this scheme where the users of the network themselves can determine whether uh, a crosslink is available or not available just by querying the the network and doing this statistical analysis and so the, the the clients themselves, if they see a a, a bad uh, crosslink in the beacon chain, can automatically fork away and just ignore that that branch, um, which is a, an, an interesting way of enforcing things, uh, where the usual model is you know you just trust the validators because you have this honesty assumption and and they will do all the enforcing. And there's a question from the audience, which is, what is the definition of the security assumption under which the invalid crosslink is unlikely? Yeah, so um, basically, we have this, uh, this pool of validators, the, the main pool in the beacon chain, which uh, we assume some fraction is, is honest. And then we, um, we do sampling on that. So, the sampling mechanism basically involves two things. One is two parameters. One parameter is going to be how big your committee is. So the, the bigger the committee is, the, the better, because it means that your committee will be more statistically representative of the wider pool. So you have smaller variance, and, and, and that's better for security. The other consideration is going to be the quality of your randomness. So if your the randomness that is generated in the beacon chain has um, some uh, manipulability uh, baked in, then you need to take that into account. Um, in terms also, uh, is this, is the, is, I think the question was, are we assuming that the, the, the percentage of the people, so, so, so you said it's an honesty assumption, right? So you're assuming that people are honest and not corruptible, or is the assumption that they're not corruptible fast enough? Aha, uh -huh, I see, yeah. So. We have um, a, a resampling of a 
of a new committee every epoch, which is on the order of, of six minutes. And need, so, so, so the question I have here is, so for crosslinks in particular, do we need a majority of the committee uh, for that shard to um, be in favor of it? Yes. This is the one thing I couldn't understand about the spec because um, so the, the, the general rule for the shard itself is LMD ghost, but then what's the rule when we have these crosslinks in? Yeah, that, that, that's right. So um, there needs to be a majority, and specifically we have two thirds, so it's a quite a, a conservative threshold. Um, so you need majority for, for a crosslink for it to work, whereas normally for other things, it, the voting would happen later. Right, so you have this, uh, this kind of discrete voting, uh, which happens on the per epoch basis, and the voting is only meaningful. You only create a, a crosslink if you reach this very conservative threshold of two thirds. Uh, and then there's this more continuous and fine grain voting, which happens on a per slot basis. And this is going to be LMD ghost to try and resolve short term forks on the shards. But it's still the case for availability that we need. Uh, just as for validity, for availability, we need an honest member of the majority that agreed to this, that, that said this was yeah. good. Yes. At least uh, to be sure that we're going to. And this was, this was the problem for Polkadot, is that we really didn't want to assume an honest majority of 100th of our validators. Even yeah. if they're random, it can be the case that, that because they know who each other is, uh, you know, the bad guys could just have a small percentage of the state and wait until they own some committee. Yeah, so that's a problem that we don't have in Ethereum because we're assuming hundreds of thousands or even you know close to a million validators. Um, and and also, if you're waiting by stake, it depends a bit on the distribution, right? Um, yes, so there will there, for sure there will be larger players and smaller players, but we assume that you know the the, the large players, uh, you know, at least non in isolation, can um, can reach the the required thresholds. Of a majority of any shard, um, yes. for any six-minute interval, yeah, yeah. We, we think we could get that. So the thing is that what what we do is that we the we break down every single validator, um, as in e economic validator, as in one one entity. We break it down into multiple validators in thirty-two ETH chunks. So every validator has the the, the same amount of of stake. Right, yes, yeah, so this is something we had to do for Polkadot. It's, it's, it means our, our particular validator election is very different than it was in, say, Cosmos, because we want all our validators to be equal. But how do we, but does that mean a validator with thousands of ETH needs to be able to run on 100 shards simultaneously? Yes. Yes. So that is one of the nice properties is that we have fairness. So the little guy who only has 32 ETH, um, you know, they they should be doing a small amount of work. They should only be um, validating one single shard. If you're you know a whale with thirty two thousand ETH, then you know you should be doing much more work, pro rata to to the gains that you you you're making. And so you should be basically validating on every single shard. And so another interesting uh, question here is. Uh, that's not something that is applicable to Cosmos, right? Because in Cosmos, validators don't rotate. They're assigned to the to the zone. And so they have the state, right? In Ethereum and in Polkadot, the validators rotate. Naturally, they cannot have the full state of the of all the shards, right? And so in uh, uh, so you're saying, Justin, in Ethereum, they're rotating every six minutes, right? So what do you think will be the meaningful? What is going to be the number of shards, right? How do you think of the size of the state of each shard, and how much time do you think the validators will need to download it as they as they rotate? Uh -huh. So we we have a, a very nice uh, separation of concerns between kind of uh, the, the security of crosslinks, where we have these crosslinks committees which are shuffled extremely fast, and the notion of a persistent committee, which is assigned to a shard on a on a longer term basis, you know, on the order of days, and they are assumed to have the, the full state. Now, the way that we kind of reconcile the two is through the notion of a, what I call hybrid statelessness. So you have the persistent committees who, have, who download the full state, and you know, that could be on the order of, of hundreds of megabytes, you know, probably not much more than a gigabyte, 
And um, by having all the state, which they can easily sync in nine days, they can make very good informed decisions about inclusion of transactions, you know, so they can prioritize things uh, relative to gas and things like that. Um, the crosslink committees, they, they don't care about the full state. The only thing they care about is the state that is involved in the state transitions in the current epoch, which is going to be a much smaller subset. And this much smaller subset, you can provide Merkle proofs for every single piece of state that is accessed. And so this is going back to the stateless client approach, where the, the, the crosslink committees don't have any state. And so this is why I, I call it the hybrid approach, where on the one hand, you have the crosslink committees, which are stateless. And on the other hand, you have the per persistent committees, which are stateful. But of course, this means that the crosslink uh, committees don't know that this, this thing they're building on is available. No, they do, because they will make sure to download the blocks uh, and download the yeah download the blocks is the main thing, but also download the the state which is involved in state transitions. Right, and so they download the blocks since the last crosslink, or something like that. Exactly, they download the blocks since the last crosslink. Okay, that makes sense. So so yeah, Polkadot validators have a um, a similar relationship with power chains. We would take them very quickly. And they basically only process like client proofs that um, that these blocks are valid. Yeah, is there any? Uh, but the collators have the full state, right? So it is very similar. Um, very full nodes of the power chain will have the whole state. Right. So, so it's similar. That's that's what Justin calls hybrid state. Yes, it's yeah. the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so from here, I think the next interesting. Uh, so. So just to confirm, so now crosslink committees they actually validate the validity of every block, right? Yes. I see. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. And so the next question, and, and this is I think where it becomes the most interesting is uh, the chain is not independent, right? They, in a sense that they're not isolated, they communicate with each other, right? So how is atomicity of uh, cross shard transactions ensured? And so two questions here is one: how quickly cross shard transactions can happen? So what? What, do, what does a shard need to wait for before executing a transaction which initiated on a different shard? And then the second question is, uh, are they atomic by design? Or, and uh, if yes, how it, is, uh, uh, how it is insured? And Zaki, let's start with Cosmos. Ah, you're still muted. OK, so are, are cross-chain transactions atomic? Um, so cross chain so um what we are what the ibc protocol the inter blockchain communication protocol which um has um has has uh, uh, uh similarities to cross linking um in in its in its in its nature um uh at its at the lowest level specifies a sort of broadcast only protocol um, which is which is you know similar to UDP in terms of internet packets, um, and essentially doesn't provide atomicity guarantees. But then um, the idea is is that the higher that the uh, higher level protocols um, that specify, for instance, token transfers or other kinds of messages uh, can specify the need for uh, acknowledgments. Um, and acknowledgments then provide the way of bootstrapping atomic transactions. So where um, where where the transaction uh, uh, where the state machines only advance um, on mutual acknowledgement that uh, uh, a packet has been received. Cool. And so, in a disaster situation, that one of the zones. So so let's say there was two zones, right? Zone A and zone B, and yeah. there was some sort of uh, there was some sort of higher level protocol which allow the transfer from A to zone B. But let's say that then there was a disastrous event and turns out that zone A at some point in the past was corrupted. So at that point, will it not be allowed to revert to the previous state? OK, so let's let's talk about um, uh, two things. Um, so as I have said, that Cosmos doesn't do anything to guarantee data availability. Um, and so because of the fact that we don't have any get data availability guarantees, um, it is, and we do not uh, uh, have really any guarantee of 
uh, liveness, nor is the lack of availability and the lack of liveness really uh, distinguishable from each other um, in a uh, asynchronous setting. Uh, so first thing that um, first thing that would happen is um, um, the first thing that would happen would be the um, would be the um, the first thing that would happen would be the um, okay so sorry uh, first thing that would happen would be okay so you you send a packet to a to you send a token to from zone A to zone B um, in the process of of sending the packet zone B never responds or the response is not available to zone A within some timeout. Um, and if the higher level protocol specifies that acknowledgements are needed, um, if zone B, if, if, if the token does not propagate back to zone B um, in, in, the, uh, in a sufficient time frame, uh, then the, the token on zone A would probably be unfrozen um, by the higher level protocol. Uh, the second question is, is, is there a mechanism in order for there to be uh, to revert an invalid state. So from the point of view of IBC and the inter-blockchain protocol, um, any state in which there is consensus is canonically valid. Um, we don't make it, we don't define um, state in terms of some state machine in the base layer protocol. So if the validator set does, so the, the validators, the uh, Cosmos is, IBC is not designed for um, a system where at, let's say, block height, you know, 1,000, uh, the validator set, two-thirds of the validator set signs off on an invalid state, decides they've made a horrible mistake, and decides to sign off on a new block 1,000. Um, the, if, if they decided, if something went wrong, let's say there was a programming error or something else uh, went wrong in the system, um, and that same validator set decided they, they would probably just do uh, some sort of upgrade or out of band change that uh, uh, reverts the state in the state machine while preserving the, the block. Um, if the interchain communication protocol is ever shown two blocks at the same height, both signed off by two thirds of the validator set, that would automatically halt the connection. Makes sense. Cool. Uh, so, so Justin, what are the what do shards wait for before they uh, process the cross-shard transactions and how is that emissity guaranteed? Right, so, so one, one interesting thing is that in Ethereum 2.0, we have no <laughs> trined notion of transaction. So this is a bit of a controversial statement, but we have no transactions. Um, and so if you want to have a notion of transaction, that is at the application layer. And you know, there's a million ways to do transactions. And there's all sorts of trade-offs that you can take. So I, I'm thinking I'm, of transactions. I honestly have never understood this. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about how transactions don't exist? Right. So um, <clears throat> like, one way of thinking of a, of a transaction is that you have, um, <clears throat> you have you know, m multiple things as part of a transaction. You have. For example, a signature, you can have uh, a replay protection mechanism, which is a, a nonce. Um, you have some ETH to pay for the gas. Um, you have some sort of uh, you know, destination, which is pointing to a contract. And it, it turns out that all these various subcomponents of a transaction can be abstracted away. So instead of enshrining a specific you know, signature scheme, such as ECDSA or BLS signatures, you can have a script, you can have a contract itself specify its own signature scheme. So you know, the, the contract just receives data, like a blob of data, and then it, it might say, okay, you know, the, the last, you know, whatever, 100 bytes are the signature, and I will have my own custom logic for that. Now this has several advantages. One is that it simplifies the consensus layer. Because now the consensus layer only needs to have a notion of a, a virtual machine, you know, such as WebAssembly, and it doesn't need uh, you know, to, to include things like ECDSA. The other reason why this is uh, valuable is that it's, it's, it's strictly more powerful. 
it's more flexible. So, um, you know, when you take signatures specifically, it allows for uh, if the application layer wants to uh, quantum safe signatures. So you can have a, a hash based signature scheme. And if suddenly quantum computers come along, then at least not all of Ethereum will, will come crumbling down. It, instead, you know, each individual application can can choose to to upgrade uh, at the ledger. So in Ethereum 2.0, is there like an on-chain application layer code base? And then there's um, like sort of user provided data blobs that invoke that application code base? Is that how to understand it? So the, the only thing that we have in Ethereum uh, 2.0 is the notion of a contract. Um, okay which has code and storage okay. and contract calls. OK. And that's it. Got it. And then you can, if you want to have a notion of transaction, then you, you can have your own replay protection mechanism and, and whatnot. Interesting. It's hard to deal with gas in that model, though, right? How yeah. do we stop the spam of people if we have some very long process to check signatures? I. Um, I, I so yeah, I have two questions. I I don't understand how gas works in in Polkadot, and I don't understand how gas works in Ethereum two point oh. So both of you could could explain it to me. It would be great. Yeah, so that's a very <laughs> good question, Alistair. That you know, there needs to be some basic functionality for gas, and um, that is is something that that that, that we provide. Um, one is that we need to have like a you know metering of of the opcodes. Um, so that we have a, a notion of a, of a gas limit and that there is uh, no spam. The other thing that we need, uh, which is slightly more subtle, is that we need to protect the block proposers, so those who will select the transactions and put them in, I said transactions, but you know, select the contract calls and put them in a block. Uh, against the denial of service attack, where uh, basically they do they do a lot of work and they're not guaranteed to get paid. Now it turns out that this problem already happens with Ethereum 1.0. So if you gossip a transaction with a bad signature, then you you're, you're wasting CPU cycles of whoever is going to be you know receiving that transaction and checking the the, the signature. And, and seeing that it is wrong. The nice thing about ECDSA is that there's a there's kind of a, a cap. There's a maximum amount of work that you that you're going to waste. Um, and so, one of the things that we want to do in Ethereum 2.0 is to provide a, a similar invariant. So when you receive a transaction, as a block proposer, you know how much CP, how many CPU cycles in the worst case you're going to be wasting and not getting paid. Um, yeah, so th th yeah, this is a serious issue for things like Zcash, I think. Uh, I have no idea how they solve it. Because, but in Ethereum 1.0, it, it's easy. Um, anyway, at Polkadot, every parachain has their own notion. There is no system wide version of gas. Um. So, okay, so I, I have a question about that. Um, so if there's no system-wide uh, uh, payment of gas, how do the non co validators that are randomly elected get paid for their work? Um, the validators get paid, well, they basically get paid on, on, on the relay chain. They're relay chain validators. They stake in dots and they get paid in dots and there are limits on what they can be able to do in a single block. Okay. So the, um, there is, a, but how you, is up to the power chain. Okay. So it's basically like if your effective block gas limit gets exceeded um, in, in in the in terms of during the during the execution. The validators do not don't sign, and therefore the block never is is never finalized. That's right. Yeah, there is some probably quite subjective limit on uh, when on how much 
work, how much computation time is too much for a, uh, for a, a block. Yeah. We haven't fully dealt with this in Tendermint yet. Um, it, it, there's, there's definitely briefing from malicious proposers in Tendermint right now. Um, it's uh, it's it's something that we probably that we have to deal with eventually. Yeah, we found it. It's very difficult to. It's it's, it's actually the, the gas the gas model has certain advantages when it comes to pricing uh, transactions. And the relay chain isn't going to have any smart contracts at all. But we need to be careful in pricing things. Anyway, I should probably ask, ask answer the question about messages. Sure. <laughs> that I haven't got around to for Polkadot yet. Um, so the way message passing synchronizing with Polkadot works actually much simpler than many other systems. So because every sort of state, the state of the relay chain sort of defines what parachain blocks has happened. Um, so, a para, so, you know, a parachain block has happened when it's hashed on the relay chain and each parachain block can send out messages to other parachains. And then when the other parachain comes to build on that, that relay chain hash, it has to act on this message. How is it? Um, so the block, the block, the block will not be accepted if it does not act on the message, right? If it does not, or, uh, yeah, there's a set of messages that it should be acting on, and it's not accepted if, if it um, doesn't act on those messages. And there will be sort of hashes and signals on the relay chain to say that we get, we have a message from this. All the messages of this block hash up to this, have this Merkle root, so we can verify. What that. happens is, and, so so let's say this took it to parachains, right? And let's say that in one, at the particular height of the relay chain. All 31 parachains send some cross-chain communication to one of them. Uh, will it not yeah. be the case that that one will will not be able to deal with all the messages in one block? That one has to deal with all the messages. I see. It's, uh, yeah. That, 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 that's certainly the difficult one to price. The difficult one to work out how to avoid everyone spamming one chain. But but could it be that the, the lower bound of processing all the messages and the upper bound of... Uh, there's also the separate bound we just discussed on the on the gas, right? Could it be that the the gas bound is below the the the, the lower bound of how many messages you need to process? So, yeah, there will be a limit in terms of sort of how much messages you can pass out, you can send out, mm -hmm. and there will be ways to uh, for a power chain to sort of block another power chain from spamming it and just make it illegal for them to send messages to us. Um, but fundamentally, we should be acting on all messages that get sent to us, mm -hmm. even if all we're doing is buffering them to act on later, there's no way messages can go missing. And if you compare Polkadot to Ethereum, right? So so this concept of manual rollback, which Justin was de describing recently, in Polkadot, that's uh, that's implemented on the protocol level, right? If, if an invalid block is detected in the past. We, we roll back. Uh, ho hopefully, we'll, we'll detect the invalid blocks. So certainly, we, we uh, before we define. So one of the reasons why we actually want a finality gadget on top of a, uh, uh, on top of a, a slower block production mechanism, unlike using Tendermint, is that we want some extra time to roll back if we have to. Um, yeah. Because it's certainly much more ugly to roll back once we've actually finalized something. Yeah. Right, yeah. And, and so, that, Justin, in your response, I, I actually missed the... Uh, maybe you didn't answer, maybe I just missed it, but... Uh, uh, so even if we abstract out the concept of transactions, right, there's still some cross-chain communication. And uh, uh, do the do the contracts define what they want to see on the on another shard in order to pr proceed, or or is there some predefined condition under which the 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 the, the multi-chain execution will happen? Right. So in terms of what uh, layer one provides um, is um, asynchronous. Uh, cross shard contract calls. Um, so you can have a contract on shard A makes a call to a contract on shard B, sends some ETH in addition to making the call, and then uh, that goes uh, in, in, a, in a cross link, and then once shard B is aware of the cross link, <coughs> you know, the, they, they can pull, pull the data uh, uh, from from the cross link, um, and 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 make the call. Um, and the process happens approximately once an once an epoch, not one, right, not once per slot, right? Yeah. So it's the the communication <laughs> at layer the order of epochs, which is on the order of, of, of minutes. Now, mm -hmm. all of this is layer one infrastructure, which has in a way nothing to do with transactions. If you if you 
think of transactions, then you have this whole design space. And so you can you can choose a, a set of trade-offs. Um, you know, you can you'll be trading off things like latency and and security <laughs> complexity. So one of the things it's you know it, it's totally possible, for example, to have um, a a channel that is open between two contracts on on two different shards. And here, the notion of transaction would you know would would be instantaneous. Um, but you can also have um, <clears throat> one one idea which is which is interesting is the the idea of um, you know op optimistic crosslinks. So you, you, these crosslinks are super high security, but they take a bit of time. But it turns out there's there's a gradient between uh, a crosslink being totally finalized and no crosslink at all. So you can start looking at at the votes that the individual validators in the shard make, and you can look at kind of the the attestations piling on. And you can use heuristics to which are you know, much lower latency to, to make informed decisions as, as to which crosslink is, is most likely to come in. And you know, we're talking, the orders of magnitude is probably 99.9% you know, .9 certainty that a crosslink will eventually be finalized you know, on the order of seconds. That's kind of the, the guarantees that we want to provide. But if you want full 100% uh, guarantees, then you have to wait the full epoch. And one of the nice things about Polkadot is that um, it sort of we can act on things after one block. So it, it might be we get about 15 seconds to send something from one chain to another. And it's not finalized, but we can send lots of messages back and forwards and finalize them all at the same time because of the shared state. Right. So in okay. Ethereum, we, we don't have the luxury of having every shard be aware of every other shard on a slot by slot level. Simply because we have, you know, a thousand shards, and, and that would be, you know, the, a quadratic uh, kind of. Uh, well, it would be too much information to 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 communicate. What we do allow is on an, in an opt-in basis at the application layer, if shard A wants to be aware of shard B on a slot by slot basis, it can do that. But it, it's kind of an opt-in thing, and we let the market kind of determine what are the most valuable routes. Um, in in this complete graph of of shots. So there's a question from the audience. I think that's a question to Justin, which is, uh, if it is the case, right? So, so so if a single shot gets corrupted, right? Then we would have to get to the social consensus later if they apply invalid state transition. So if that if we already have to resort to social consensus in the case where some threshold of validated, validators is corrupted. Why do we need the finality gadget on the beacon chain to begin with? Does that make sense? So if we have to resort to the to the social layer, um, either there was some sort of bug, you know, that in the implementation um, that we can we can fix and you know uh, deal on an ad hoc basis, or um, you know, we, we, we're not meeting the security assumptions. And if it's, if it's the latter case, then, you know, we're, we're just, we're fucked because there's, there's nothing, you know, our system would, I mean, one thing I guess we could do is we could, uh, we could hard fork and make the, um, the thresholds more aggressive. Um, so instead of having a two third threshold on the cross link, we could have a, a three quarters threshold or, or whatever. I mean, the, the trade off there is that we, we would lose on liveness and we, it, it would be, Potentially higher latency to to make the crosslinks, but you know if the the reverting to the social layer is really a, a an extreme thing, and hopefully we won't have to resort to that. Cool. I mean, one of the things that we're looking to do, kind of to harden the system in 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 this aspect, and to to minimize the possibility of having to resort to these uh, manual uh, rollbacks is. Is also improving the randomness, and so that that ties in with the the VDF roadmap, uh, where we're basically upgrading from Randau, which is which has some amount of uh, manipulation, and the the amount of manipulation kind of grows with the amount with the size of the attacker, to uh, a randomness beacon, which which has 
which has no manipulation, basically regardless of the size of the attacker. Cool. Okay, so let's uh, let's wrap up the panel. That was uh, that was very informative, I, I hope, and for everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, as the closing note, uh, if there's anything exciting happening uh, in your ecosystem that you would like to share with the communities, that would be a great opportunity to do so. Or otherwise, just uh, let's just say a couple of final words, and we can start with Zaki. Um, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, thanks for this. Uh, I actually got some questions I've I had wanted answers to for a long time answered. So that was really helpful for me uh, about both the Polkadot and Ethereum 2.0 designs. Um, let's see what's going on in Co what's going on in the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, the you know, like I said, the you know, or what I would you know always characterize the Cosmos ecosystem as is. is um, we share largely the same goals as both the, the Polkadot and Ethereum 2.0 project in the sense that we want to make um, Byzantine fault tolerant computation, um, uh, ubiquitous, affordable, available to the world. Um, and we think that is a noble endeavor. Um, and I think we all share that. Uh, we've just sort of been prioritizing things differently from other projects. Uh, so our our biggest priority right now is getting this uh, inner blockchain communication system uh, up and running, um, and great progress is being made. In fact, I have a catch up call with uh, Chris Doe, who's the uh, technical lead on the IBC project. Uh, right after this, um, really encourage everyone to just like participate in the community, uh, watch those repos, uh, everything associated with them. I would also, uh, you know. We are we are trying to position the inner blockchain communication standard as something that would be will be helpful for people who are building uh, sharded systems um, with stronger security assumptions, and also um, for uh, you know systems like Ethereum 2.0 and Polkadot, which certainly do not assume that they're going to be in a closed world where uh, they are the only chain that exists. Um, so uh, they will also need an inner blockchain communication system with the same security assumptions as uh, our IBC system. Um, so we encourage everyone from all those communities to participate in our in our IBC repo, uh, which will probably be the first system of its kind, um, sort of for the 2.0 blockchain 2.0 world. Cool. <coughs> Any final words? Yeah, no. It was. Thank you for 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 having me. Um, I mean, I I I love comparing the the various systems and the the, the trade off. I guess one way that I think of uh, of, of uh, you know the, the the spectrum of of trade stuffs is partly with um, with kind of cosmos on, on one extreme and then Ethereum on on another extreme uh, and then in, in the middle Polkadot um, and the you know the extremes one is kind of homogeneity and the other one is 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 non homogeneity and then kind of um, polka dot in the middle where they uh, they have some amount of of homogeneity at least in in the in the security uh, model uh, but not necessarily uh, in the in the zones or the the, the shards or the, the parachains um i mean one of the things that's going on in in ethereum 2.0 is trying to um you know collaborate more with with other blockchain projects so um you know we're you know we, we've made this effort recently to try and um uh, standardize on 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 the hash function and i think it, it it's great that uh, you know from a, a de facto point of view everyone is using sha256 and so well, you know we, we might as well join the crowd and i, I think that's a big win we're also looking to Standardize on uh, BLS twelve three eighty one. So again, there's, you know, there's, especially in, in, in proof of stake systems, there's, there's this need to have efficient handling of, of signatures because you potentially have many people voting, and uh, BLS signatures are, you know, can provide a hundred x or a thousand x scaling in in that respect. And the the great news is that everyone seems to be converging towards a specific curve, uh, BLS twelve three eighty one, and you know, I just before this panel, I came out of a, a standardization call where we're making tons of progress. So very happy there. 
we're also looking to collaborate on the VDF project. You know, th there'll be more announcements there, but the surface of collaboration there is, is pretty huge. We have the, the MPC, uh, where we're going to generate this RSA modulus. And it's also going to be useful for RSA accumulators. Um, we're going to have a distribution of hardware um, where we also want uh, many people to join in. We we're going to have these, these competi circuit competitions uh, where we want lots of people to join in. And we also are looking to go collaborate on a financial standpoint because it's, it's, you know, it's a, a multi-million dollar kind of project. And, uh, we could use uh, help from uh, from many different uh, players. Um, yeah, I mean, the other exciting stuff that's going on from a legal standpoint is that we're starting to um, to put more effort on on phase two. I'd say phase zero and phase one are are you know are, are quite mature now, and it's a matter of finding bugs and, and polishing. And and the exciting thing about phase two is that. It's, it's quite challenging from a research standpoint, but I'm hoping that from an implementation standpoint, it will be pretty trivial. You know, with all the abstraction that we've made, we've kind of removed complexity and we keep remo removing complexity. And at the end of the day, you'll have, I'm hoping, a very thin layer on top of WebAssembly. And so I'm kind of hoping that we'll get um, phase two almost for free in the same way that we got phase one kind of almost for free uh, from, from phase zero. Cool. Awesome. Alistair, anything exciting in, uh, happening uh, in Web3 and Polkadot? And final words? Well, in the first thing I want to say after the response to Justin is, yeah, I, uh, standardization is good. Um, we're kind of in favor of all those things. It'd be really nice if Ethereum smart contracts could understand the crypto we're using. Um, anyway, so in Polkadot, um, <laughs> yeah, this design is quite ambitious, and we're still a few months out from launch. Uh, we're going to have a beta shortly, and the main thing that we want to communicate is that for people wanting to build a parachain, parity substrate is already out there, um, and you can start building on that soon, so they know what we're doing. Um, beyond that, yeah, we want to try and get uh, to work on bridges. To work out how to talk to everyone, I think there's. Uh, it's very easy for Cosmos, but uh, very hard for everyone else. And that's what's going on. Cool. Okay, great. It's so, a very interesting uh, panel. <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, so let's end here. Uh, thanks everyone for watching, uh, and uh, until next time. Thank you, guys.